Chapter 11, Multiplexing and Demultiplexing, also known as Channelization. The topics we're going to be covering are different types of multiplexing, uh, whether it be frequency or time or some form of variation of the uh, two or code uh, divisional multiplexing or amplitude. There's a, a lot of different types of multiplexing out there. The point of this is we're just covering a few of them. Uh, we're going to continue the discussion for data communication by introducing the topic of multiplexing. Multiplexing is such an important topic and it's one topic that a lot of people don't get to have and it really is a critical component for our data and our communications in general. Uh, let's talk about its motivation, define basic multiplexing, and actually talk about modulated uh, modulation and modulated carriers. H that's a big one. Uh, not so much nowadays, uh, but it was super important before. I mean, it's still super important, it's just not as super critical as the early 2000s. So the concept of multiplexing. Multiplexing refers to the combination of information streams from multiple sources from a transmission over a shared medium. So essentially what that means is taking and combining multiple signals to stick it on one signal. And on the other side, being able to separate those signals. A very quick, just brief view overview of multiplexing. Think your uh, broadband or cable provider. They provide phone, data, and TV on one physical or shared media. Uh, that's a type of multiplexing. Actually, they do it based off of frequency. Uh, they set a specific frequency for TV, specific frequency for data, and a specific frequency for phone. And that's how they're able to set all three of those on one media. Uh, and demultiplexing just kind of represents the separation. Here's the example. Multiplexing on the one side because it combines all of the signals. Demultiplexing on the opposite side because it separates the signals. So the basic approaches that we're going to talk about are frequency, wave, time, and code. Uh, the big two are actually time and frequency, but wave is also another form of frequency. It's just normally used for fiber optic, and the code division is for more for uh, cell phones or mobile phones. So, frequency multiplex division. We're assuming that you already understand frequencies and amplitude and modulation, things like that. So, how frequency modulation works is, is it actually sets different types of filters or uh, interference, which actually allow the separation of the different types of data. So, for example, we have a 1000 megahertz capable media. We actually set so that every uh, device might have 80 hertz or 80 megahertz. We have a 20 megahertz uh, band or protection on it. That way we can have up to 10 carriers. So, essentially, how that works is between 0 and 10 megahertz, it's a band. A band is just a protection barrier. Uh, between 10 and 90 megahertz will be the actual frequency that data can travel. Then between 90 and 100 would be another band. And they just kind of stack on one another. But that way, the data that is going between 10 and 90, uh, you know belongs to that specific type of mechanism. Going back to the uh, cable provider, for example, that might be your audio or your, your phone system. So as long as it was between 
10 and 90 megahertz, the systems recognize that is only for phone. So what happens if there's a jump or a spike or something that happens to the signal that changes it? That's actually why we have those guard bands. That band is, is there so that if it jumps over 90, it knows that's just abnormal and it kind of cuts it off. That way it doesn't interfere with the next frequency. That'd be the frequency between uh, 100 and 110 being a guard band, between 110 and 190 being the next data, and between 190 and 200 would be the other guard band. That way if it jumps from 90 uh, megahertz to 105 megahertz, it's only a 15 megahertz difference but it won't affect the other data sets, if that makes sense. So essentially, here is an example of our frequency division, and that is we have, well this is the demultiplexing version of it, but we have one shared media, that one shared media comes into a demultiplexer, and then individual filters filter out those lines. Again, going back to the same example I just used, filter 1 might be the only filter that recognizes uh, one, uh, 0 to 100 megahertz. Filter 2 might be the only uh, filter that recognizes between, two, uh, between 100 and 200 megahertz, so forth and so forth. But that way, each of these filters will only be able to filter out their specific set of data. Uh, Going back to the, the cable example, you'd have three filters, one for phone. That way it would filter out all the information for data and TV. You'd have the second filter for data. So that filter would actually filter out everything for phone and TV. And you'd have a third filter that would be for TV. And that filter would filter out the data and phone. So what are some of the advantages of using frequency division multiplexing? It, it allows you to use the shared transmission media. It actually also allows you to, to break up uh, larger types of cables that have high frequencies so that you can carry more data on it. That's actually a big thing is being able to carry more data on one shared media. Now remember, we're going back to the practical uh, frequency division, if the guard bands are too close, for example, there's only like a one megahertz difference between each of the data lines, might be, be too close, it might cause issues. Hence why we have to have a guard band that's a little bit larger. But because most people are visual people, here is the example. I notice between channel 1 and channel 2, there is some form of space. That is what I meant by a uh, guard band. That's just a certain a percentage of the, the cable that is set aside for protection. That way, if there's ever an issue with channel 1 and there's too much data or it spikes or whatever, it doesn't affect any other channel around it. Here's another example, uh, just represented a different way. Here we have channel 1 using between 100 kilohertz and 300 kilohertz. Uh, then there's going to be a 20 kilohertz difference between 320 kilohertz to 520 kilohertz. So here the guard band is 20 kilohertz. That, again, is just going to be a separated between each of the different channels. Now, the actual guard band might be different in different situations. It really all depends on what you're doing. So don't take it as it's always going to be 20 kilohertz or 20 megahertz. It's just, it might be different depending on the data or the signal or the cable type that you're using.
So one of the important things here is understanding why we do blocks or channels for frequency. So it's easier to break it up into organized connections. For example, the 100 to 300 uh, kilohertz. We know that that will send off one specific set of data. It could be our voice, could be our data, could be our television, could be a specific type of data. And that means as long as you get that those speeds or that, that frequency, you know exactly what it is. If we didn't organize it, then it would be a lot harder. One of the issues with frequency division is it is susceptible to noise. And that is any form of distortion or electrical current that will make that frequency be larger than its channel. There's two primary ways to dealing with the, uh, the frequencies. And a big part of that is understanding the guard band. Here we talk about a key, uh, carrier. And pretty much the key carriers are just how many carriers you have, how many channels you need. And then the bandwidth is normally 1 divided by your K. So if you have 10 carriers, 1 tenth of that is going to be your guard bands. So once we have one specific uh, channel, we can actually do some form of frequency uh, multiplexing again. So we can actually use subchannels. This actually helps with the immunity to interference because we start drilling down on our individual frequencies. So if we have a 300 kilohertz frequency range, we can actually subchannel them out. It's essentially contractors and subcontractors. You have one. You might have several channels, and then each of those channels actually can have sub-channels. Uh, think of, again, going back to the uh, in cable provider, they're going to provide phone, TV, and internet to uh, a neighborhood. So what they might do is they might have 10 houses on that one physical connection. So within that one physical connection there are 10 channels. Each house gets a channel. And then, at each house, each house has three sub-channels. One for TV, one for internet, one for TV. That way, every uh, house still has the three channels, TV, internet, phone, but there's only ten main channels because there's only ten houses. It's just a way to, to subdivide our connections. What about a hierarchy frequency uh, division? This is the same thing, it's just a different way of organizing it. So here is an important one. So, what happens if we do 12 analog phone lines and we actually group them together so that we can have a super group or a larger group. So if you ever wonder about T1 lines, so T1 lines actually are 26, one, uh, 56k connections and they just kind of bundle them together. And that's done as a, a hierarchy frequency, to, uh, multi frequency division multiplexing. Or you can actually go the opposite way, where you have coming from the right going to the left of this diagram. You might have a phone company in, in an area give you a jumbo connection. That jumbo connection goes into a neighborhood, and then it starts breaking it down. Individual streets, and then individual blocks in that street. 
and that's how they are allowed to do the phone lines. Because actually this is a big one how a lot of the uh, ISPs work is each neighborhood might have one of the diagrams on the, the left. Uh, so what ends up happening is your neighborhood would be grouped together and then each neighborhood would be a super group and then each major area might be a jumbo group and so forth. Now let's talk about wavelength division multiplexing. So essentially wavelength and frequency division are essentially identical. The only major difference is wavelength is more applicable to optical fiber. Essentially, instead of dealing with frequencies, as frequency is normally within copper cables, fiber optics use wavelength. Thus, wavelength division multiplexing applies to optical fiber. The input and output uh, are the same. Uh, the same mechanisms, one signal coming in multiplexed, one assist there, one wavelength going out into separate different types of wavelengths, demultiplexing, same essential setup. The major difference here though is instead of having different frequencies, we have different types of light. Hence why it will go through a prism and then the actual different colors separate the different frequencies because depending at what frequency the wavelength is generates a different color. It sounds really complicated, but it really isn't. Here we have our multiple different types of data coming in, different wavelengths. It will go through a prism and it will be carried through one specific uh, light. That one light comes out to another prism on the opposite side and it is separated into the different uh, colors. That essentially is the same thing with frequency division multiplexing, just with light instead of electricity. Next, time division multiplexing. Same type of system, except instead of going parallel, it's going sequential. And that is Assuming we have three senders, they take turns. So the first sender, the second sender, the third sender, and they don't have unlimited. Like they have, you have a two second window to send your data. And then it uses all of the bandwidth or throughput for that two seconds. And everyone gets two seconds before it repeats. But what happens if Again, it goes one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. What happens if at a specific point that two has no data? For those two seconds, all that bandwidth is being wasted. And so, we have that issue that we're going to miss synchronous time division multiplexing. And that is is round robin, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Except here in our example, it uh, we're gonna assume it has four just because our diagram has four. So it's now one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But again, what happens if one node or one device doesn't have anything to send? It's wasted. So I am building up to there is an asynchronous, which that means not everything is round robin. If it notices one and two are sending more than three and four, one and two get additional slots. And so it might go one one, two two, three four, one one, two two, three four. That way three and four only have a smaller section or a smaller window. Most things used time division or synchronous time division multiplexing. But one of the issues is, is the demultiplexer didn't really understand 
where if we're doing one, one, two, two, three, four, it knows that the standard chunk is separated by very specific clock uh, differences, but we had no way of changing that up. So we, that's why asynchronous had to be very organized. That way they had to agree that one and two would have two slots each, three and four would have one slot each. That way it would know the first two chunks of data would be for one, the second two chunks of data would be for two, the next chunk of data would be for a three, and the last chunk of data would be for four. But we had to actually organize that. That way there was no misinterpretation of, again, if we organize it, one getting two, uh, two getting two, three and four getting one each, and we assumed it was all going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, we would have wrong types of data. Or we'd have misinterpretation of data. So what we had to do was some form of framing. Uh, framing was just organizing or grouping of one actual completion. So in this example, one, two, three, four would be framing. In the example that I kept bringing up, one, one, two, two, three, four. So we would have six different groups for our framing. So now that we talked about frequency division, time division, hierarchy, uh, frequency division, wavelength division, we have one more. We have hierarchy time division, or yeah, time division multiplexing. This was actually in our uh, T1 connections. If you'll notice that we have 24 DS0 phone lines. Those 24 DS0 phone lines made one DS1 phone line, or T1, then T2, then T3. So that's actually how we got our T1 connection speeds. We actually grouped 24 digital phone lines together, or, an or 26 analog or 24 digital phone lines to make up our one 1.544 megabits uh, phone line. And again, there is a very specific hierarchy to this so that for each level 1 or DS1, we have 24 DS zeros. For each uh, DS2, we have at least 4 DS1s, so forth and so forth. I went back, sorry about that. So now we can talk, start talking about the problems. What happens about if there's unfilled data chunks? Here's the example. So, computer ha one has three bits of data to send. Computer two has two. Then computer three has one. Within that structure or within that time division, we're going to have some blank slots, and that is empty space. Uh, that means we have wasted throughput or wasted bandwidth because of the way the data was organized. So we came up with this statistical time division multiplexing. So it runs some form of statistics on the data, and then it recognizes that one might have one and two might send the most data, so they're going to have the most slots. Thus allowing us to maximize the data flow between all the senders Though, with the statistical uh, multiplexing, there's extra overhead, and there's extra demultiplexing overhead. And a big part of that overhead is some form of identification on the sender and receiver end. That way, their sender and receiver know which chunks of data it's sending out.
So what about some form of inverse multiplexing? That is taking one signal and breaking it down to multiple. Which we already talked about our T1 connection, and that's essentially what this is. We have a high-speed connection, 1.544 megabits per second, going over phone lines. So we actually had to break or inverse multiplex 26 individual 56k modems or 56k connections, not modems. It will go through this or 26 different 56k connections, and at the other end will be multiplexed together to form again one high-speed connection or one 1.544 megabit connection. The important part here is they're not really backwards compatible. Like, we cannot inverse multiplex uh, several pieces of conventional multiplex uh, just backwards. It doesn't work like that. The inverse multiplexers are very specific. Alright, now that we've covered most of the basics, we have one left, and that is our code division multiplexing. And that is typically known in our CDMA or our cell phone technology. And that is essentially uh, CDMA relies heavily on mathematics uh, idea of orthogonal uh, vectoring space. That is not something that we normally have to deal with. Uh, electrical engineers, mobile phone engineers, those guys have to deal with this. Normal PC or communication technicians don't. And that is essentially, it deals with a very specific form of multiplying of the sender and receiving to get several bits. Uh, for example, here we have a sender A trying to send two bits of information. The data value then becomes a very specific key and the key might be different depending on who's sending it, how much they're sending. Here is the actual formula. And again, most people do not have to deal with this because this is for mobile phone or very specific electrical engineers because this goes way more in depth than what we need to go. Anyway, that is the end of chapter 11. The CDMA is actually one of the most complex ones, and again, it's not one that we typically have to deal with. If you have any questions, please let me know. If you have any concerns or issues, again, please let me know. Let me know how I'm doing so that if I can get better, I can improve. Thank you guys, and I hope you guys have a great day.